Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Before we get into today's topic, I want to say a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning platform that hosts thousands of classes from people willing to share their skills so you can develop yours. There are so many classes to choose from, you are sure to find something to take your fancy. Last time I talked about Skillshare, I was learning from Justin Bridges on the fundamentals of DSLR photography, which I found to be very valuable. This time, I'm hoping that Taylor Loren's excellent course will be enough to get me to be brave enough to post a TikTok. Taylor's course helpfully lays out how to use the app to shoot and edit a TikTok, which until now was a mysterious form of wonder magic to me. In my defence, I basically live in the 16th century. Fortunately, Taylor's explanation was super clear, for which I am very grateful. She even offers insight into how the algorithm functions. Skillshare is a creative and inspiring community. Skillshare is the place to keep you learning. With a Skillshare membership, you can access their ever-growing list of premium classes to explore whenever suits you. There are also live sessions that you can try if you want that real-time learning environment. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. As with the last time that Skillshare sponsored a video on this channel, we're once again going to look at an historical skill that I would say is fortunately now unnecessary. Escaping from imprisonment in the dread fortress of the Tower of London. But will the featured figure in today's video make it out? And will they manage to stay out? Before we hop into the imprisonment and escape attempt, I want to provide some broader context, because a lot of the videos on this channel cover Tudor topics, and today we are jumping forward in history by around a century, so I think it's time for a whistle-stop and highly simplified tour of the route that the Crown took after the Tudors. So, Elizabeth I dies, and the Crown passes to her first cousin twice removed, James VI of Scots and I of England. They remain two separate kingdoms until the Act of Union of 1707, even though they are governed by the same person. James is succeeded by his second son, Charles I, who will be executed for treason in 1649. I've got some videos on that that I will leave linked. Thus began the period known as the Interregnum, where Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector. He was followed in this role by his son, Richard, who became known as Tumble Down Dick, because he was unable to hold power for even a year. The Republican experiment concluded when Charles I's son, Charles II, was invited to return from exile to reign. Charles II had lots of children, none by his wife, so at his death he was succeeded by his brother, James II. The new king had two surviving daughters by his first wife, Mary and Anne who were raised in accordance with the Church of England. James, meanwhile, was drawn to Roman Catholicism. He would convert secretly, but would eventually practice openly. This openly Catholic brother to the king was widowed. His second wife was a devout Roman Catholic from Italy, Mary of Modena. A few years after he came to the throne, Mary gave him a son, also called James. Now this Catholic king's Protestant daughters were being displaced in the succession. Tensions flared. Ultimately, in 1688, James's daughter Mary and her cousin husband, William of Orange, were invited to take her father's throne and force him into exile. It's known as the Glorious Revolution, or even the Bloodless Revolution, which it was in England, because there was lots of bloodshed in Ireland. 
With James and his son in exile in France, there would be a rival monarchy and faction in the wings, named for the Jameses they were seeking to return to the throne. They were called the Jacobites. With that, I think the stage is set for us to meet today's protagonist, William Maxwell, 5th Earl of Nisdale, who was born in 1676, probably at Terrigal's Castle near Dumfries. William's father Robert died while he was very young, around six or seven, so his upbringing, or perhaps more appropriately his indoctrination, is credited to his mother, Lady Lucy Douglas. Roman Catholicism and allegiance to the Stuart kings was the order of the day. The title of Earl had come to him at his father's death, but confirmation of that title would not come until 1696. William was 20, and it was now eight years after the so-called Glorious Revolution. It is thought that the next year, 1697, the newly invested Earl was sent to France to spend time at James II's court in exile. While there, he met Lady Winifred Herbert, who had travelled to the continent with her James II supporting parents following the events of 1688. Winifred and William were married in Paris on the 2nd of March 1699. Despite the couple's allegiance to the exiled king and the Roman Catholic faith, the Earl and Countess returned to Scotland and to Terrigal's castle. While there were certainly faithful Roman Catholics in both England and Scotland, both nations were Protestant, Church of England in the former and Presbyterian in the latter. The Earl and Countess of Nisdale were the focus of suspicion from their religiously conforming neighbours, which would lead to surveillance, incursions and forced searches of the Nithsdale property in the belief that Roman Catholic priests might be secreted within. On one early occasion, on Christmas Eve night 1703, a band of 100 armed men breached the castle's defences to conduct a search of the kind just described. Although William would be acquitted of providing accommodation to Roman Catholic agents by magistrates in Edinburgh on the 21st of February 1704, his hereditary stewardship of Cacubri was taken from him. Of course, William's faith was not the only cause for concern for the government, because his loyalty to the successive incumbent royal regimes was also in question. In addition to maintaining surveillance over him in this regard, he was called upon to pay a bond of security against his continued good conduct. William seems to have felt the pressure of his situation. On the 28th of November 1712, he chose to hand his estate over to his eldest son, also called William. Three years later, in 1715, the elder William, the father, became embroiled in a Jacobite uprising. James II had died in exile on the 16th of September 1701, but by 1715, the time of this uprising, his son by Mary of Modena was in his late twenties, and he was ready to press his own royal claim, by force if necessary. The political landscape in the nation James was looking to rule was vastly different in 1715 to that which his mother and father had fled with his own infant self. His half-sister Mary had died in 1694, her husband William had then ruled on until his own death in 1702. As William and Mary had no surviving heirs, Mary's sister Anne ascended to the throne. She also died without a surviving heir in 1714. The Act of Settlement of 1701 required her successor to be a Protestant. In 1714, that meant skipping over a large number of people. 50 is the number frequently banded about, all of whom had a closer blood claim. Eventually, they get to George, the Elector of Hanover, who became George I, King of Great Britain 
and Ireland. As the Jacobites rose up, William, Earl of Nithsdale, ignored calls to come out for the incumbent government. He joined the uprising instead. He joined the fight to put James III on the throne. For nearly a month, William fought alongside his fellow Jacobites, but they would ultimately surrender on the 14th of November, 1715. William was taken as a prisoner to London, and he arrived in the English capital on the 5th of December. He was promptly confined in the Tower of London. He was charged on the 9th of January 1760 and was tried alongside other Jacobite lords in Westminster Hall. William acknowledged his traitorous guilt and begged for the King's grace and mercy. It was not forthcoming. On the 9th of February 1716, one month after he had been charged, William was sentenced to suffer the brutally full punishment for treason. He was to be hanged, drawn and quartered on Tower Hill. He was returned to the Tower of London to await his fate. But we're here to talk about how to escape from the Tower of London. So far, William Earl of Nithsdale has not shown himself to be either an architect of or a participant in well-ending plans. Enter the Countess, Lady Nithsdale. Winifred, who travelled from Scotland to London, and as she was travelling in the depths of winter, snow forced her to abandon her coach, but undeterred, she made the rest of the journey on horseback. She sought out the great, good and favoured to plead her husband's case. It's reported that she was able to ingratiate herself successfully. There were rumours that a reprieve or even a full pardon might be on its way for William. Winifred also went in person to present a petition to George I. He refused to accept it. She, in her desperation, grabbed hold of his robes, but George did not stop. Winifred was dragged to the end of the room where she was stopped by the guards. The event only bolstered her position. George's rudeness was highlighted, which nurtured popular sympathy for her and her cause. Eventually, Lady Nithsdale's petition was read before the King but it seems that she had by this point become convinced that any hope of clemency was forlorn. A new plan was required. On the 22nd of February 1716, William's execution was imminent. Winifred, as a distressed widow-to-be, came to the Tower of London to bid her husband farewell. She brought three ladies with her, a Mrs Morgan, Mrs Mills and Winifred's maid, Cecilia Evans. The women were there for hours, talking, praying, coming in and out of the room, weeping and wailing, generally making a confusing scene. And so the story goes, William's guards, who had been compensated to encourage their compliance with this confusing visit, eventually lost count of the comings and goings, of who was in and who was out of the room. One by one, the ladies left. Winifred remained alone in the room with her husband. The guards could hear her comforting him, but left them uninterrupted. Winifred now departed. As she left, she told the guards that her husband was at his prayers and should not be disturbed. But you can guess where this is going. Winifred and her gal pals had smuggled in an extra lady cloak. One of those weeping ladies that had left the tower after bidding farewell to William was William himself. Lady Nithsdale had been talking to herself to buy him the time to get out. It was not long before his escape was discovered and at first William was in hiding in London, protected by sympathisers and housed for a time by the Venetian embassy in London but he would soon leave with Venetian help for safety on the continent. During this time, Winifred was also in London awaiting news of her husband's successful flight abroad, at which point she returned to Scotland, 
to settle the family's affairs before making her own way to continental exile. Lord and Lady Nisdale were welcomed at the court in exile. William was a lord-in-waiting to the pretender, who was still styling himself as King James III. Winifred was lady-in-waiting to James's consort, Maria Clementina Sobieska, and was also appointed as governess to the couple's younger son, Henry Benedict, who would in later life become a Roman Catholic cardinal and be styled as Cardinal Duke of York. Henry Benedict was also the last of the Jacobite claimants to assert himself to be the rightful ruler of England, Scotland and Ireland. However, Henry IX, as Jacobite supporters referred to him, made no attempt to make good on the claim and actually seize the throne. As the French Revolution was getting underway in 1789, the Pope was recognising George III as King of Britain. And the protests of his Cardinal Duke of York would do nothing to change his mind. When his claim to the throne was being denied by the Pope, Henry Benedict was 64 years old. I wonder how much he thought of, or, or even remembered, the woman who had been his governess for a couple of years just before he turned five. Despite the romance of their escape together, and their relative prominence at the Jacobite court in exile, at least for a time, life on the continent could be dull. Lord Nisdale certainly complained of boredom. The couple's lifestyle was also clearly no longer within their means. William was in perpetual debt. Winifred bemoaned how ragged her dress had become. William died in Rome in 1744. Winifred devoted until the end to the Jacobite cause and the family of James III, died in 1749, also in Rome. A souvenir from the escape that made this couple so famous still exists. The cloak, used to smuggle William from the tower, is said to be on display at Tracare House in Inalivan, Scotland. Would you be interested in making the trip to see that? But what do you think of William, Winifred and the tale of their escape? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. Or you can find me on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Follow me there so we can continue this conversation. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? Please also let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, maybe have a little check just to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there checking or subscribing, why not hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.